Hey everyone, today we're going to be talking about cha 7.2, which is really kind of from chapter 11 in your book. Um, and it's going to just have to do with more about normal distributions and finding probabilities, maybe that aren't necessarily nice values like we use the empirical rule for. But we're going to start with uh, bell work here, where you actually are using the empirical rule. So let's read through this together, and then if you want to pause the video and give it a shot, you can. So the amount of sleep a teenager gets at night is normally distributed with an average of 7 hours, and a standard deviation of one hour. So they're giving us our mu and our sigma. First, I want us to graph the distribution and to label one, two, and three standard deviations above and below the mean, and then find some different values. What percentage of teenagers sleep between five and seven hours? How about between eight and nine, more than six, or less than six? So if you want to pause the video right now and give this a shot, you can, and then we'll try it together. All right, so let's give this a shot. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create my distribution. I've got a blank page on the next page here. So I'm just going to make my normal distribution. And it doesn't have to be perfect, something like this. And I'm going to put right in the middle our average, and that's 7 hours. Then we're told the standard deviation, so we're told the average is 7, we're told the standard deviation is 1 hour. So the way I'm going to find that is I'm going to find the inflection point. Remember, that's where the curvature of the graph changes from, uh, looks like we're going downwards here, and then we change to upwards right about there. So it looks like that's about where my standard deviation will be. So that'll be 8, this will be 6, one more out will be 9, and then 10. Very few people will get more than 10 hours of sleep. Here we'll have 5, and then 4. So you can see just kind of a rough sketch is just fine for this. Now let's see what they want to know next. They want to know what percentage of teenagers sleep between 5 and 7 hours. So 5 to 7 is going to be this area right in here. So from our empirical rule, we know that between 5 and 9, so if we go two standard deviations below and two above, that's 95%. And it looks like we want half of that area. So half of 95 is 47.5% are going to be between 5 and 7. That's all there is to it. Now let's see what else they want. How about more than 6 hours and then less than 6 hours? So more than 6 hours, get rid of our 95% here. So that is starting at 6 and going all the way off to infinity to the right. So to do that, get rid of my area from the last problem here. So I want to know what this is right here, this value between 6 and 7. And then from 6 and out, that's 50%. That's not too hard, right? It's just half of the entire curve, from 7 out, excuse me. So just from 6 to 7, well, 6 to 8 is 68%. So this guy right in here, that is 34%. So 34 plus 50 looks like 84%. That's all there is to it. All right, let's go back one. So now they say, how about less than six hours? So for less than six hours, let's think if we can be creative about this. So we just found more than six hours. It was 84%. So less should be 16%. We can think about it, though. So again, if we think about between six and eight, there's 68%. So this is 34% uh, right here. This entire thing from seven to the left is 50%. And so 50 minus 34, once again, 16. So it works out. Hopefully you've uh, got the empirical rule down now with the homework that we had from yesterday. All right, let's try something new. So 7 to 7B is called z-scores. We actually have seen z-scores already this year, back in chapter 3, I think it was. Uh, but today we're going to actually talk about changing z-scores into finding these areas under density curves, or under specifically normal curves. So let's take a look. So let's talk about what a z-score is. So a z-score is something we actually talked about back in chapter 3, and we're kind of using it more in, in more detail now to talk about the area underneath a normal distribution. So uh, a z-score is a statistical measurement of a score's relationship or distance to the mean. So the way I think about this is how many, how many standard deviations away is a certain value. That's kind of the question it answers. So for example, at our normal curve, if we have the average right in the middle, there's mu. Standard deviations at the inflection point, and then it goes on beyond there. So if I had a value like right here, that z-score looks like it would be like 1.5, because it's 1.5 standard deviations away. Over here, 
maybe like right here, this value, maybe that has a z-score of like negative 0.75, because it's 0.75 standard deviations away, it's within 1, um, and it's on the left side, so that z-score would be negative. And to find these values, you just take the x-value, subtract the average, and divide by the standard deviation. So um, let's take a look at an example of just using some z-scores. So we have a normal distribution here. We have an average of 50, so I'm just going to put that in the middle right away. And this is something that's always really smart to do, is just put your values in right away. So there's 50. I guess this then would be 56. This would be 62. What's happening? And then on the left side, so I guess right here, we would have, um, that would be 68. Well, that keeps coming up. Um, and then over here, over here we would have uh, 44, over here we would have 38, and then here we would have 32. Alright, so let's find the z-score for 62. So I'm going to use the formula. So z is x minus the average over standard deviation. If you didn't write that down on the last slide, you're definitely going to want that. So we take the value, so this is our x. So x is just the value we're plugging in, so it would be 62 minus our uh, average, which is 50 divided by the standard deviation. So the standard deviation in this case looks like it's 6. They give us that, in fact. So that's 6 over 6, which gives us 1. Now that makes sense, because 56 is exactly 1 standard deviation away. So it makes sense that the z-score is 1. For 44, any guesses what that's going to be? My guess is that it's going to be negative 1. Let's try it. So we do 44 minus 50 over 6. That's negative 6 over 6, which is indeed negative 1. Okay, so that z-score is negative 1. So then I say, what value yields a z-score of 1.2? So we know the z-score this time, and it looks like our value should be somewhere between 56 and 62. Um, maybe something like 57, 58, I don't know, let's find out. So we have 1.2 is equal to x minus the average, which is 50, divided by the standard deviation, which is 6. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 6. Looks like I'll then have um, 7.2 is equal to uh, x minus 50. And then we add 50 to both sides, so we have x is 57.2. So like we said, is just beyond 56. Our prediction was right. So solving for z-scores is pretty much what your first homework page is, and it's really quick. So you pretty much got that down now, being able to calculate these. So the z-scores for being exactly 1, 2, or 3 standard deviations away are actually really easy because Remember, the z-score tells you, the z-score, which the formula is, and you want to put this on the front of your packet, there's a spot for it, x minus the average over standard deviation, and the z-score tells you how many standard deviations away you are. So if we're two standard deviations away, what should the z-score be? I think it should be 2, right? Because if we use this exact distribution, which is kind of a special one, say where we have an average of 0, and a standard deviation is 1, so if I do like 2, Let's do 2. So I have 2 minus the average, which is 0, over the standard deviation, which is 1. That gives me 2. So it makes sense that if your two z-scores away, or your two standard deviations away, your z-score should be exactly 2, because that's how far away you are. That's all there is to it. So really nice values, and don't forget you can use these with the empirical rule. We're going to learn some harder ways of factoring, um, excuse me, um, some harder ways of finding probabilities today uh, where you won't be able to use the empirical rule because right now all we can do is have these exact values and find the area in between them but if we have like a value here and a value here let's say and I want to find the area in between it's gonna have to do with finding the z-score because that's standardized over any normal curve that you have so let's take a look so suppose a student can either submit only their SAT score or their ACT score to a particular college. Suppose their AC SAT score was 550 and their ACT score was 24. Which score should the student submit? So the thing about z-scores is it does a nice job comparing you to, or any data point to all the other data points. Because it says this is a very good score, that would mean having a high z-score, um, because that would mean that you're far away from the rest of the data. If it's a lower z-score, that would mean you're not as far away. So let's take a look. So here they say uh, SAT or ACT. Their SAT is 550, so I'm going to do the z-score for SAT, well, Z SAT. So that's going to be our value, 500, 550, excuse me, minus our value, 500, divided by the standard deviation, which is 100. Looks like that's 50 over 100, which is 1 half. The z-score for the ACT is going to be, uh, let's see, they had a 24 score. 
minus the average, which is 18, divided by the standard deviation, which is 6. That gives me 6 over 6, which is 1. So it looks like the ACT score would be the better one to submit because it has a higher z-score than 1 half. And that's all there is to it. So let's talk about percentiles. Percentiles are the percent of area, percent of area to the left of a value on a density curve. So basically what this is saying is that you're finding this area right here. So if they give you a value, if they give you a value, you have to be able to find that area. And we do that by using z-scores. But percentile is something you might have heard a lot in testing. They say you're testing at the 99th percentile. They make a portfolio like, um, excuse me, they make a, um, a bell curve like this, and then they figure out how much percentage of the other test takers did you beat. Did you beat 99% of the country, or 98% of the country, or 97% of the country? And um, then they use a normal curve like this to be able to make that calculation. So there's a kind of an interesting question here that was posed. Um, can you picture a baby at the 25th percentile for height, but the 70th percentile for weight? So that means that they're among the quarter shortest birth uh, babies, but also they're at very high on the end for weight distribution. So this would be a short, pudgy baby. So let's take a look at finding some probabilities on the normal curve for values that aren't necessarily empirical. So we're not given a like exactly one, two, or three standard deviations away. We have to find something for a z-score that's a little bit more exciting. So um, let's just come up with a z-score example. Before we had a 1.2, let's say like z-score is like 1.23. So the, you have a table that looks kind of like this in your packet. Um, all of them are exactly the same. This one, it shows kind of what the curve looks like. It also has has um, all the values kind of in a, a table here that has different colors delineating which one is which. Yours doesn't have the colors, doesn't have the curve, but the values would all be the same. So what we do to find the area to the left of 1.23, table will always tell you the area to the left. So you always have a picture here. If they have a picture, they'll have it shaded like this to show it's really finding the percentile for that z-score. And the cool thing about normal curves is that no matter what uh, the standard deviation and mean are, if the z-score is the same for two different curves, the area to the left of that value will always be the same. So all you have to do is calculate the z-score, look it up on the chart, and it will tell you how much area is to the left. So here, if we have z equals 1.23, here's how you do it. On the left side, you look for the first de uh, place and then the first after the decimal. So 1.23, here's 1.2, and then we're going to scroll over to 0 0.03. So the reason for that is that you added the two together. So 1.2 plus 0.03 is 1.23. You don't have to know that. You just have to be able to find it on the chart. So 1.2 and then scroll over to 3. That's right here. And they tell us that 89.07% of the area underneath the curve is to the left of that value. So we look further to the right, like we go to like 3.49, we see that almost 100% of the area is to the left of that, because 3.49 is going to be like right there. So pretty much all of the area is to the left of that value. Let's try another one that often trips people up. Let's try uh, z equals 2.05. So 2.05, that's a z-score that's going to put us, let me get rid of that guy. So it's going to put us past 2, just barely. So here is our mean, here is 1 standard deviation away, and then 2 would be like over here. So 2.05 would be just past there. So we're trying to find all of the area to the left of that z-score value. So 2.05. The reason I bring this one up is because a lot of people start by looking for 2.5, but we want 2.0. So we're going to find 2.0, and then we'll scroll over to 5, which is right here. Looks like 97.98% is going to be to the left of that value, or 0.9798. You can give a probability as a percentage or as a decimal. Either one's fine. So this table shows all values starting at 0 0.5. Sorry, excuse me, at 0 for the z-score. So where would a z-score of 0 be? It's kind of worth thinking about that. A z-score of 0 would happen right at the average. Right? And you expect 50% to be to the left, which is why exactly 50% is there. So it starts there, and it moves all the way over to 3.49. And beyond that, uh, pretty much everything's going to be 99.99% that's to the left. You'll never get to 1. 
but if you went far enough out there, it would have a value very, very close to 1. So these are all values to the right side of the curve. You also have a sheet in your packet that has the negative z-scores. So a negative z-score just means that you're on the left side of sigma, or sorry, of mu, of the average. So these should all be values less than 50%. So if we had, for example, if we do our z-score calculation, x minus the average over standard deviation, uh, and we get a number that's like, I don't know, negative um, 2.3, let three, yeah, let's just do 2.3. So I'm going to find negative 2.3, there it is right there, and because there's nothing else along with it, I'm going to go to the zero column, which is right here. So it looks like there's a, uh, about a point, or sorry, about a 1% chance that you have, um, an area to the left of negative 2.3. Remember, these areas are always to the left. Negative 2.3 is pretty far out there, so that small value makes a lot of sense. So let's try some problems with these. So here we are. We have the z-score for an ACT score of 18. Well, that's not going to be too bad because the average is 18. So make a hypothesis. What is that z-score going to be if we're right on the average? How many standard deviations away from the average are we? should be 0. But let's do the calculation. So z will be our x value, 18, minus our average, which is 18, divided by the standard deviation, which is 6. That's 0 over 6, which is indeed 0. So if we go to our chart, which you can check on your sheet if you wanted to, 0.0, .0 looks like 50%. So you have 50 percentile. 50% 50 of the data lie uh, below that z-score of 0. So let's try a little bit more exciting. This time we have a, a score of 20. So I'm going to do the z-score formula. So 20 minus our average, which is 18, divided by our standard deviation, which is 6. Looks like that's going to be 2 sixths or 1 third. So then um, asking what percentile corresponds to that, uh, to that score, 1 third for a z-score is about 0 0.33 repeating. And if we want to find the percentile that corresponds with that z-score, all we have to do is go to 0.3 and then rule over to 3 right here. Looks like that percentile would be about 62.93%. That's it. So finding areas to the left of values, really not that hard. Uh, just using the table here. You need to, someone just kind of show you how to do it, and then you can do it on your own just fine. So here's another example, different distribution. So they're saying the length of 10th grade girl's hair is normally distributed with an average of 10 and a standard deviation of 4. So they made the curve for us here, which is nice. They ask for the z-score for hair of length 16. So z would be 16 minus our average, which is 10, divided by our standard deviation, which is 4. Looks like 6 fourths, which is 3 halves. Okay, so that is our z-score. They want to know the uh, percentile as well. So the percentile is going to be the area to the left of that value. 3 halves is 1.5. So I'm going to go back to our chart, which I think I have right here. And that won't go quite high enough. Let's go to the official one. So 1.5 was our z-score. So I'm going to 1.5 and then all the zeros because we want to get that value for exactly 1.5. Looks like 0.9332, which makes sense because a lot of the area lies to the left of it. Like I said, 0.9332. So if you were talking specifically about um, uh, percentiles, you might say that this person's in the 93rd percentile. Cool. Percentile. <laughs> All right, let's move on. So once again here, we're talking about these girls' hair. So suppose the z-score for a particular 10th grade girl's hair is negative 2.65. They want to know the percentile. So this part, like, they already did half the work for us. They found the z-score for us. We don't know what the length of the hair is, but they tell us the z-score. So to find the percentile, it's negative, so that means we must be on the left side of the curve somewhere. And we want to find the percentile, so the area to the left. So negative 2.65, here's negative 2.6, here's 0.05. Looks like there's a 0.4% chance that they're going to find, or sorry, um, that uh, you would have hair that is less than a z-score of negative 2.65. So 0 0.004. So about four tenths of a 1%, very small. So one more with a twist here. So the data for the length of 10th grade girl's hair, once again, is normally distributed with an average of 10 and a standard deviation of 4. There's our 10, 14... Here would be 18, 
and then on the left, six, and two. So what percent of girls have hair shorter than 15 inches? So 15 is not one of the values on here. 15 would be like right over here somewhere. And what we're going to do is we're going to shade in everything to the left of 15 because that's the area that we want. So there's the area right there that we want. And to get that area, we just have to convert to a z-score. So our z-score is going to be 15 minus 10 over 4. Looks like 5 fourths, or 1.25. So now all we have to do is go to our chart and figure out what 1.25 corresponds to. We're going to have to go back to our big chart here. So 1.25. Here's, uh, that's negative. So 1.2, scroll over to 5 right here. Looks like that's 0 0.8944. Here we go. So 0 0.844 is the percent of girls, so 84.4%. Have hair shorter than 15 inches. Next up, what percent of hair have gr girls have hair longer than 7 inches? So for longer than 7 inches, this is kind of interesting. Seven's going to be over to the left somewhere. They want to know they probably have longer hair, so that's going to be everything to the right. So this is where you kind of have to use your brain a little bit. Um, our z-score for seven is going to be seven minus uh, ten divided by our standard deviation, which is four. So it looks like that's negative three-fourths, or negative 0 0.75. So if we go to our chart, and if I negative 0.75, I'll have to look on the negative side, right here. Negative, what would we say, 0.75? Mm. Yep, negative 0.75. So negative 0.75 is what I'm looking for on my negative chart here. So here's negative 0.7, and then we scroll over to 05. Looks like 2266. But the trick with 2266, let me put this down here. That is the area to the left. I want the area to the right. Well, what do we know about curves? What does it all add up to? That's up to 1. So then this shaded area right here is going to be 1 minus 0.2266. Maybe grab a calculator for that. So I'm going to do 1 minus 0.2266, and that gives me 0.7734. So whenever you see a more than or a less than, just make sure that you're getting the right part of the curve. And let's look at this last problem. What percent of girls have hair between 8 and 13 inches? I'm going to get some space for myself here. So between 8 and 13. So here's our curve. Average is 10 right in the middle. Here's 8 somewhere. And here's 13. So, uh, let's figure out how we can do that. So, all the chart tells me is areas to the left. Well, I argue if I can find the area at 13 and the area at 8, I should be able to find that area in between. Because 8 is going to give me everything over here. 13 is going to give me everything all together. So, if I find the 13 and then subtract the 8 off, that should work just fine. Okay, so let's find the area at 13 first. So, we have to find the z-score. 13 minus 10 over 4. 13. So that'd be 3 fourths, or 0.75. And at uh, 8, so we're trying to find the area to the left of 8, that's going to be z is 8 minus 10 over 4, which is negative 1 half. So let's do um, the 3 fourths z score first. So we're going to go back and find our z score. So 0.75 was the value we had. So here's 0.7, uh, oh, got to go to the positive one again, 0.7 is right here, and then 5 is right there. So 0.7734. So that's 0.7734. That's our area to the left of 3 fourths. And then negative 1 half. So this one I can use the negative one for. So negative 0 0.5, and then it's all zeros. Looks like 0 0.3085. So 0 
So now we have x, that's our x. And this guy up here is includes the stuff we actually want to use. So what we're going to do is take that value and just subtract x. So it'll be 0.7724 uh, minus 0 0.3085. Grab our calculator for that as well. So 0 0.7724 minus 0 0.3085. And I get 0.4639. So that's the percentage of girls that have hair between 8 and 13 inches. Kind of cool. So that's all I've got for you today. Um, the homework sheets are really quick, so you are going to want to try all of these because it's not going to take you all day. Um, 72A is mostly about z-scores. 72B is about some rudimentary calculations, just some simple stuff. And then C kind of puts it together. So do take a look at all three. I'll be checking that when I get back. Uh, other than that, you got the rest of the hour to work on homework. I love you guys. That's why I'm here. Have a great day. See you tomorrow.